this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work again. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. You know, fortunes are made or lost, not by what happens to us, but by how we react. Bad things happen to good businesses. Now it's up to you how you want to respond. A lot of owners right now are cutting expenses to the bone, just trying to survive. Some are being paralyzed with fear. A rare few are taking the opportunity to reevaluate their business. Now that the shock has settled in and we are now in the process of restarting, it's really a unique opportunity to rethink what it is you want to create, how valuable a company you have, how much it runs without you, and what you might do now, maybe give it a little bit of extra time to structure it so that it can be something that lives without you and ultimately is a sellable asset. It's exactly what we do at Value Builder. You can check out some resources at valuebuilder.com. There you'll get a questionnaire, which will allow you to look at your business through the lens of an acquirer. We can also connect you directly with a certified value builder, a trained expert in the value of companies and someone who can be your sounding board as you think about rebuilding. It's all available at valuebuilder.com. So I've got a bit of a confession to make. I can't stand it when companies call themselves mission driven. I just find it so inauthentic just to fail to try to disguise the fact that the company is there to make money, which is why it was so refreshing to do this next interview with Ashok Vasudevan. Ashok really is a mission driven entrepreneur. And I got the sense very early in the conversation, as you will, in listening to it, that his mission was in no way a corporate veil. It was authentic. Right down to the point when he was looking at acquisition offers, of which he had many, generated by Goldman Sachs, he said that valuation wasn't that important to him. In fact, it was one of the least important things. What he was trying to do was, in his words, land the plane into the hands of somebody who would take his vision and propagate it and grow it in a much bigger way. Here to tell you how to actually create a real mission-driven company is Ashuk Basudevan. Ashok, welcome to Bitsa Radio. Good to see you, John. Yeah, it's great to it's just great to to learn about you. Now I've seen Tasty Bite in the supermarkets here in Toronto. There's a, a chain called Loblaws and it's carried. So I I'm kind of familiar with the brand. Uh, but for those who don't know Tasty Bite, can you just describe what it is that Tasty Bite sold? Sure. Um, Tasty Bite is a range of all natural convenient specialty foods ready-to-eat foods that are shelf-stable, uh, which means it requires no refrigeration, no freezing, and these are ready to eat. And we had Indian, Thai, Asian, uh, rices, sauces, the whole range of products that we sold available in most supermarkets nationally in, in a few countries in the world, U.S. and Canada being, being a how large. Did you get, how did you get into it? What was the start? Um, the story goes back to 1994. Mira and I, Mira is, um, is my wife and the significantly smarter of the two of us. But more <laughs> important, I might deny it. But she and I started this company with $5,000. This is the story that every entrepreneur, I'm sure, you know, has seen before, has experienced before. So we, have, you know, we started the company with $5,000 on our dining table. Uh, with, um, she was already a bit of an entrepreneur. I was more corporate. I had come out of Unilever and Pepsi, and she had come out of market research. She had already started a market research, a qualitative research company before. And um, we relocated, and we were living in Stamford, Connecticut at the time. So we started that in 94, and we grew from there. Uh, let's just say that we, we had that business for about 25 years. 
Oh. We started with two of us and we ended up, I think, with about 1,500 people. Uh, Unbelievable. And just got lucky, I guess. So. <laughs> Probably a little more than luck, which is what I want to get into. <laughs> so the actual cooking itself of uh, you coming up with the recipes and packaging them for grocery stores. I mean, that's a very expensive undertaking. Did you do all that yourself? Did you use uh, outside vendors to do that for you? Uh, actually, we started as a trading company. It's good to give you a little bit of a background. Mm -hmm. So we didn't start as a manufacturing company. We started as a trading business. We had the rights to Tasty Bite. The company Tasty Bite itself was actually at the time based in India. And that company got acquired by Unilever in India as part of some ice cream acquisition that was happening. So this is a very tiny company. We are talking about a sub million dollar company in India. And we just had the distribution rights because we liked that product, we liked the technology, we liked what we could do with that brand. As things turned out, our business in North America grew in the US. And then a couple of years later in 96, uh, we approached Unilever, which by the way is the company I worked for a decade. And so I knew the people who were involved in that, uh, in that part of the world. And we actually bought Tasty Bite, the Indian subsidiary from Unilever, which was then a public company. It was actually a, a bankrupt. By that time, it had declared bankruptcy. But there's a whole story to the back end. What, so how did you, what did you pay for the bankrupt assets of Tasty Bite India? Like as a multiple of, I mean, how do you value a bankrupt company? I know, it's an interesting question because at the time, the company, the share price of the Tasty Bite company, the face value of the share was 10 rupees. 10 rupees is basically a penny stock. Uh, and we acquired that business and we had a private equity join us and then we, we took control of that company. So we, you know, we had to pay uh, roughly what the share price was in the market, uh, which is more an asset purchase than really, a, it was not like a multiple of revenue and there was no EBITDA, it was a sick company. It had wiped out its net worth eight times. It had dollar debt, yen debt, Deutschmark debt, <laughs> that pressing credit for about eight times the size of its revenue. Why not just create your own brand? Why not just, I mean, you know, instead of buying this kind of company based in India, why not create it yourself in the U.S. market? So it's, it's a very sophisticated technology. So this was a company we could not have built from the scratch easily. Mm. Idea was a great idea. It just happened that it had not taken off either in India or in its international efforts. We just happened to come in and you know, do a couple of things to, um, you know, to the brand that just happened to resonate. Um, that's why I said we got lucky. So, and then we said, instead of building that factory ground up, which we could not have easily done, and there was a lot of skill in the business at the time. There was a lot of expertise. And so all we did was to, was to take that business and it had a hundred employees. It was a public company. It was a sorry state of affairs. It was a sick company. And it happened to be in a state which I quite, you know, which I knew well. And, and India, I knew how to navigate business in India because I had come from India. I understood agriculture in India even though I didn't know much, too much about food processing, but I did understand agriculture. So it was all the right things to have done. And the U.S. could never have been competitive when it comes to such value-added play. We'll get into that later. And there's a lot of lessons here. For Great. I'd love, to, I'd love to get there. Before we do, though, um, when you take technology, I think of a food company as you know, food. <laughs> I don't think of technology per se. What did you mean by technology? What what sorts of technology you refer to? So think about this. I mean, this is a technology called retort. And a retort technology was actually invented way back in the 60s, but was never by the, for the Apollo space program. Um, and this is a technology that keeps food um, 
preserved without the need for chemical preservatives um, for 18 months. Wow. And this technology, which is the retort technology, has two parts to it. There is retort, which is the pouch, the material of construction of the pouch in which the food actually stays. And the pouch is a multi-layered laminate that has an oxygen barrier. It has a UV barrier. It has a moisture barrier and a physical barrier. So it's a four-layered pouch. So part of the technology lies in the laminate of the pouch. The other part of the technology is in the processing. And the processing of the retort pouch is a, think of it as a flexible can. The canned food, except without the can, without the weight of the can, without the you know, the kind of carbon footprint of the can without the energy intensity of an aluminum, and without the aluminum, of course. Sure. So this is canned food without the can, and that technology is very high temperature cooking, high pressure, high temperature, and it sterilizes the food. So it's a very sophisticated technology. And did, and did the and Tasty Bite own that technology, or did they just understand how to use it? They understood how to use it, they had a lot of understanding of the soft. There's a soft part of the technology and there's a hardware. Uh, they had the hardware and took some time to perfect the software. And that's what we did over the next 25 years. And, and by the time we started, we had obviously we had a good um, base to build on. Even though the business was bad, the technology was outstanding. So we had a... And where would you say that technology ranked in terms of your success relative to other factors like your ability to market Tasty Bite in the U.S., uh, ability to sell Tasty Bite? Like, wh what, what would you pinpoint as the key drivers of your success? There are two questions. Great question, John. There are two questions to that. You said, where would you rate that technology in the success? I would say we probably succeeded despite the technology. Uh, Quite honestly, even though I'm help me square, it. help me square that because that doesn't make sense okay. to me. Given that because no. when you think of prepared foods, think of it. You're you're in North America. You're sitting in Canada. You're sitting in the U.S. When you think of prepared foods in a packet, what do you think? You go to the freezer, or you go under the glass to a deli counter. So what you buy is either cold, or what you buy is frozen, and you take it to the microwave. You don't go to the middle of the supermarket aisle. Because that's where you'll find the cereal. That's where you'll find the sauces. That is not where you'll find your dinner. You'll only find the components for the dinner. So for us to get in there and say, your dinner lies in the middle of the supermarket and not in the perimeter, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So we might be in love with our technology. And therein lies the real lesson. As entrepreneurs, sometimes we get attached to our own product, we get attached to our own technology, and those technologies are legends, and you know, we become legends in our own mind. But the truth is, oftentimes it has nothing to do with the technology. It has to do with what pain you're solving or what pleasure you're providing. Right? And, what it, and what in Tasty Bites example, how would you define you know, I think it was how it was it Howard Levitt or Theodore Levitt, the guy from Harvard. He says nobody buys a quarter inch drill; they buy a quarter inch hole. Right. right. The the kind of benefit of that. What was in your in internally when you had meetings at Tasty Bite? What what? How did you define the what you were solving, the pain or pleasure you were trying to provide? Okay, so we we, we got lucky. Most people do one or the other. You're either a painkiller. Entrepreneurs are painkillers. They see a pain in society. And they want to kill it. Or entrepreneurs are pleasure providers. You're a pleasure seeker, entrepreneurs can provide pleasure. This could go in a very dangerous direction. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> but it is seldom that you see the two come together. And Tasty Bite got lucky in that. So, for example, what is the pain when you go to a freezer and you pull out a product? Think of the pain. You think of it as ready food, it's not ready. Because by the time you take it home, you got a problem taking it home in a car, so you can't go anywhere else. You bought it, you better go home. After that, you're not going to go to a bar, grab a beer. You're not going to go to your, you know, your uncle's place and hang out. No, 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 no. You buy that, you're going home. So it's already a pain. Once you go home, it's not dinner time yet. You've got to thaw it, 
there's a process of thawing. You put it in the microwave, wait for three minutes, take it out, you stir it, you put it in. And all the time, there's a certain association of guilt, and then you're dealing with it, you burn your hand, you put it. There is pain. Um, at the end of it, at the end of five minutes, maybe seven minutes, it's, the food is way too hot. You have to wait. It was way too cold. Now it's way too hot. And so really what you thought of as prepared foods is 10 minutes away at least. That's a pain. That's one pain. Here is another pain. You look at prepared foods and what do consumers do? You look at the back and you look at the label and you look at those names that you've never seen. Ferrous sulfate, E30, calcium chloride. <laughs> I mean, things that belong in a chemistry textbook. They don't belong in food. That's a pain because you don't know what they are. Just because they've been approved and what they call grass, generally recognized as safe. GRAS doesn't give you confidence generally recognized as safe, meaning eat it, you won't die. What is generally recognized as safe? <laughs> so that's a pain. Right. And the third is, you know, it's mac and cheese or it's, it's just uninspiring food. It's food. It's just calories going in. There's nothing there in terms of flavor or when you eat a food, there's no aha moment. So you're eating it as a time of day. It's not an activity where you seek pleasure. It's breakfast time, lunch time, dinner time. Ancient cultures don't even have names for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner almost makes a time of day. It's a chore you've got to finish. So there's no pleasure, hmm. right? So imagine these three. So, and imagine you could address all these three. So Tasty Bite, we said, was natural. No chemicals, no additives, no preservatives, no GMO. And we made a simple promise to ourselves when we set up the company. We will not put into Tasty Bite what we will not put into our mouth. It's a simple promise. Till today, you know, there's 1,500 people who go into the plant. Well, today, a few people go into the plant because of COVID, but that hopefully will change soon. Make the same promise. We will not put into Tasty Bite what we will not put into our mouth. And we used to say Tasty Bite is necessarily natural, preferably organic. And so that suddenly takes away a pain to say, you know, you don't have to eat stuff that you do. Calcium chloride, really? Mm. Better sulfate? How about that? Uh, so you know that there is a pain that's being removed. Now, convenience, we called it convenience without compromise. Every time you have convenience, you know you're compromising. Think of taking junk out of junk food, right? So the second piece was to remove the pain. And in this case, we called it convenience without compromise because you associate fast foods and convenience foods with stuff that is not good for you. And, I, and true, yeah, go ahead. No, no, yeah, forgive me, keep going. And, and the truth is, we also had a, a little logo, a mnemonic in the pack, which said, one step, one minute. So if you took a frozen entree, and then you took a tasty bite pack, and let's say you decided to have Mediterranean or garlic brown rice. This is a good example. Buy a frozen garlic or whatever brown rice that you like from the freezer and buy the Tasty Bite brown rice, which by the way is organic. Go home. Now, go to dinner. You'll almost finish eating before your partner who decides to buy the frozen even starts. Because what do you do? You open the pouch a little bit, put it inside the microwave, you hit, this is 90 seconds because it's rice. And in the second minute, you're actually eating it while you're still deciding to peel off the top, you're shoving it in and hoping, you know, it stirs it. So that's the second, where you solve the pain of time and the pleasure of convenience without compromise because even this 
convenience comes without any mysterious uh, I mean look at the ingredient statement of a tasty bite brown rice it has rice it has water salt sunflower oil done easy oh, how easy is that and the last Love thing it. is flavor. most people when you eat it you know it tastes good because it's got stuff in it artificial flavor artificial color artificial something right so it makes it tasty here yeah, the flavors are unique so those are the three excellent I'd love to get into the financing of the business. You mentioned you started with Mira at, at $5,000, kind of around the kitchen table. It, it sounds like you brought in some, a, a private equity group to help you buy the Tasty Bite India mm -hmm. company. Yeah. Maybe, maybe talk a little bit about how you finance the growth. So you, did you have that private equity group throughout the journey or did you bring on no. extra money or how did it go? Uh, no, so we started. We also had. So we started with a, as a distribution company with five thousand dollars here, and we went global on day one. So we we actually had the design of the packaging done in New York, uh, actually upstate New York, very close to Connecticut where we live. The the pouch was made in Korea. The Hong the design the carton was designed and made in Hong Kong. We got the product manufactured in. Tasty Bite factory in India. And Sounds launched. like that would cost more than five grand though. <laughs> exactly, and we did not. And so what happens in all of these is we have different players. You're able to stack a business with getting multiple people to play a role and participate in the success. So we knew, I mean, we already knew the pouch maker. We knew, you know, in my, in my earlier life, we knew the carton manufacturer. We even got working capital for the sick company from a exporting beer exporting company in india um and all they had to do was to pay 50 percent of our order to tasty bite which was broke so they could pay their labor they could buy the raw materials and they would export in return they would get export credits and they would make margin on the exports we would pay them 120 days later so we had a, after the fda cleared it so we had 120 days to sell recover the money and pay them. So it's not hard to do if you have multiple players who benefit. But if we become the only beneficiary, then it becomes harder and harder. Because success this kind requires a lot of people to succeed. And we could not have succeeded if each of these did not succeed. If the carton, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, so the carton manufacturers, the pouch manufacturers, if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, gave you very generous terms to pay. Actually, they didn't give us very generous terms. They gave us reasonable trading terms, but we had another exporter. So look at it this way. Let's say they give us 60 days to pay. I'm just throwing an average number. Sure. So the pouch gets into India from Korea. India has to pay. India has to pay Korea, the Tasty Bite in India, which we at that time did not own, but we slowly started owning that business had to pay in 60 days. But they don't have the money because they're broke. Here comes a beer company that says, okay, I'll give you enough money for working capital. So we place an order, let's say for a dollar, I'm making up an example. Let's say a container costs 50, a container costs $50,000 to buy. Okay? $25,000 of that container is paid by this company, this trading company to Tasty Bite. Tasty Bite uses the $25,000 to pay its wages, buy the raw materials, and pay for the packaging material. It exports it. The export comes through the trading company. It comes to us. We have 120 days. The trading company actually has an upchart, meaning it has a markup. So it makes the money on the markup because it trusts that we will pay. We have 120 days after we clear customs in the FDA. So we got to sell and recover the money in 120 days. So this is the way we started. So I often tell people, entrepreneurs, that they will raise their blood pressure before they raise their capital. <laughs> it's true because we get victims. We become victims of, you know, of raising capital. Uh, all you have to do is to allow other people to make money and not think about how you make your margins. And then, Life becomes a little bit easier. 
So I'm not big on raising a large amount of money and then using words like burn rate. You don't need to burn, not in all businesses. You just need to have good relationships and a good story. And that helped you finance the business. Did you, did you raise any outside capital? We did. So when we acquired Tasty Bite, we had very little money of our own, though we did have a consulting firm that did help pay a little bit for it. But um, we raised private equity for one half of the acquisition. The other half, you know, we generated on our own. And because it's Unilever and it was a friendly transaction, they benefited, we benefited. They didn't have anything to do with this business. This is not Unilever's core business. This was becoming our business very important for us. And so there was goodwill between Unilever and Preferred Brand, which is the company we had in Stanford. And so, and then we had a private equity uh, come in along with us. We had a call option, which we had built into the agreement. And to explain for folks who know, don't know what a call option is, to describe what you mean by that. A call option, you know, so there are two kinds of options which are opposite. A call option is you can call. So when, when let's say this company, CDC, in our case, acquired 49% and we had 51%. And we bought Tasty Bite, the majority stock of Tasty Bite. We bought 51% of Tasty Bite in India. So now we own 51% of a public company. They own 49% of this holding company. We hold 51% of the holding company. But we say that, look, at the end of two years, three years, four years, whatever the terms could be in the shareholders agreement that we have with the investors, we say we want to have a call option. There are many terminologies here, but I'm just talking about one terminology, call option, which means I want to call on the shares that you have of the company if I can give you a certain reasonable return on investment. Like an in you have this called an IRR, let's say, an internal rate of return of whatever the number is, 15%, 20%, 25%, whatever you negotiate. And you say, if I can give you a 25% return, which means you invested $100, if at the end of 12 months I can give you $125, you made 25% IRR. In which case, I give you 125, you give me the shares, I have exercised my call option. So we, we had a call option, which we exercised three years after we acquired the business. And in 2002, we bought the private equity. And now we held about, because of an open tender offer in the Bombay Stock Exchange, we held 75% of the public company in India. What was the call option? Like, what was the return that they were, the private equity group was looking to achieve? About uh, 22%, 22%, 22%, about 20%. 20%. Yeah. Okay. Which is not so, unusual. So they held it for three years? Is that yes. what you're saying? So they yes. held for three years. So you had to give them a 22% return each year for three consecutive years. So it, over a three year period, it's much larger than 20. Yes. So the way it happens is you don't give it every year because they don't know that you're going to call. Sure. You might not ever call. Uh, there are other options. There's a put option where they can, let's not get into the detail, but that's, that's getting into shareholders agreement. But at the end of three years, let's say you invested a dollar. And if I bought you at the end of the first year, I would have had to pay you 1.22. But if I had to buy you at the second year, then I have to pay you 22% over 1.22. So it's 1.22 times 1.22. If I buy you at the third year, you know, it's 22 cubed. So you're going into 1.22. So by the time you pay, it's almost one in 1.7 times, let's say, give or take. So if they've invested a million dollars, you have to pay them $1.7 million in year three. They're happy. If you can afford it, you're happy. And, and, what was, and what was their reaction when you said, I want to call those shares and give you your money back? I, they were okay with it, actually, because they knew where we were, where our heads were. We were much more, they knew from the beginning that we were thinking large. I mean, we were thinking differently. We were thinking global. They were focused on India. We were focused on the world. We were living in Stamford, Connecticut. They were in Bombay, um, though it's a UK fund. And they were happy because at the end of the day, they are responsible to their you know, investors and their LPs. So they actually put Tasty Bite on their front magazine, you know, to say, hey, this Fantastic. Is a, it was their success story. 
as and well. how did you how did you come up with the money to pay them so by that time after? we finally bought them out in 20 in 2002 so we bought we completed the unilever transaction so let me go back to the date line again we started the company in 94 in 96 this company tasty bite got acquired by unilever in india by 98 we bought the company from unilever in india and in 2001 to 2002, we, we exercised our call option. So by now, we were already in the business for almost eight years. But that was a very, very difficult year. The year we decided to buy out the private equity investor in our subsidiary company. They had nothing to do with the parent company. It was a difficult decision. We could have died as a business. But we decided to go ahead and do it anyway. Every once in a while in the business, you bet your bank. This is one of those years. The first time we did that. Why? What was going on? I think part of it had to do with, you know, visions. It's very important to have people at the board who are mission aligned. And at some point in time, if you're looking, it's very important to know where you're looking and where somebody is looking. And if we are looking at natural convenient specialty. We are looking at the US and Canada. By now, we were already looking at Australia. We were looking at New Zealand. We were not looking at India. But that was not, you know, even though we were there, it wasn't the big part of our business. So we said, look, if we need to take control of that business. Uh, so we don't have to deal with, when you have a public company board with many people there, you, you spend a lot of time in managing everybody. So it becomes an issue of managing all the stakeholders. And sometimes that forces you to work on the business much more quickly than working in the business. And as entrepreneurs and CEOs, we always have to make a decision. When do you work on the business? When do you work in the business? In the early stages, we got to work in the business, deeply involved. And so you know, boards and governance and complicated structures get in the way of growth, uh, take time, and they all have to be managed. And so if you can let people make their money, meet their objectives and move on, it's a wonderful story. And we, you know, we think even now, I think it's the right thing that CDC did in, 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 in moving on. And I think CDC will say we did the right thing in giving them an exit because it creates genuine wealth genuine and 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 i hear you say cdc and just because we're in the depths of this pandemic i think of the cdc oh, in the u.s oh <laughs> of course we're not talking about that cdc <laughs> oh i'm so sorry cdc <laughs> no no the they were the private equity investor i know commonwealth development corporation is one of uk's <laughs> private equity firms it's we used to call it queen's money which is the there largest private equity firm way back then in india so yeah. They were, they were our partner. They invested along with us and they exited in 20, 2002. And then, yes. there were, yeah. Keep going. So, and then we had the US company, which held 72% of the Indian company. And the, the Indian company, by the way, by then was no longer sick. We turned it around. Uh, we turned it around in 15 months. We just got lucky once again. Uh, we did a bunch of things that we knew we had to do. And we turned that business is very well documented. There's even an annual report. It's a public company. And so the 1999 annual report title was The Turnaround. And it became, I think, the first company in the Indian public set, in the public company um, arena to be turned around from what in the U.S. would be Chapter 7, not even Chapter 11. In India, was, it, it was called BIFR, but it turned around. Uh, that was 15 months after we acquired the business. And then from 2002 onwards, allowed us to just grow. We then raised capital, like everybody else. Uh, so we raised a friends and family round in 2003 or four, and then we raised what we call Series A, Series B in 2007. Maybe then we raised Series C in 2010. I don't know what the dates exactly, but we raised, we had private equity coming in into the, into the parent company, not once, but twice. It was a good run for all. I mean, we had, we had, 
How much equity were you able to hold on to, you and Mira, through the whole process of raising all this money? So we held on to the majority of the controlling interest through this process, but it wasn't important because it wasn't now only about Mira and I. And herein lies the lesson. I've just been just looking at those questions, John, and this is very important. We had three other people we, who came in and joined us way back when we acquired the business from Tasty Bite. So this is not a story about Mira and I as husband and wife working together. This is not only about the two of us holding equity. There were three other people, very, very driven, dedicated. We were a team. And it's very seldom you will find a 5% team lasting 20 years in a business. We lasted the whole time. Uh, it is a phenomenal team, extremely competent. We had three B's to think of it as a triangle, experience, education, expertise. So we had, I mean, the way we say it is, we used to joke about it. We had um, uh, two Harvards, two MIT, and one NCI. Uh, from an education. Really? Yeah. Wow. The five was exactly that. And if you look at that education, and um, if you looked at experience, we had Unilever, PepsiCo, Goldman Sachs, uh, and market research, the finest sold Nielsen, uh, Britannia, and Nabisco. Uh, so we had experience, and expertise included finance, operation, agriculture, market research. So we had people who were, I mean, it was knowledge-driven, energetic, and fun. And, and lucky, most of them was, all of them, was smarter so than people, I was. It made life easy. So this, these five individuals, you, Mira, and these three others were the, 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 the shareholders that started together. They were shareholders as well, the other three individuals? Yeah, they, we didn't start together. They joined after a few years after we started. But yes, we were the five, we used to be called the ECOM, the executive committee. Got it. And so how... So did you, it sounds like you separated um, the share classes so that the ECOM hold, hold the majority of the voting shares where you had other investors. Is that yes. how you separated up? Exactly how we separated that. Okay. That's helpful. A lot of people are listening to this and are going through the worst times in their business life, right? They're in the midst of... Uh, being shut down again for a second time as a result of this pandemic, all sorts of uncertainty. As you think back of the arc of Tasty Bite, what was the darkest day for you? And, and how did you struggle through it? So let me answer it this way. I think of us as experts in failures. We have failed more often than we have succeeded, honestly. And the way I think about it is our graveyard is full of products that consumers rejected. And our graveyard has got more products than products in the market. So we, we could always think of this as a dark day. And we've had several moments where we thought, you know, we were going to be in serious trouble. And this could have been because even simple little things like there's a port strike and if that container doesn't come, you're blown, you're over. Because you have an existential crisis. When you're small, the smallest problem can become existential. And so... Did, did that actually happen to you where you had a, a container not show up? Yeah. Yeah, we absolutely did happen to us. And what happened? Um, it, just because you may have a port strike, so you think in your scheduling, you, you don't get it. So you don't have it, and you don't have it for the next 15 days and 20 days. And when you talk to supermarkets, you know, they don't always nice to you. you know? They don't really care because they have to care about you know, their customers and their shelves. You may have a perfectly legitimate story, and you might call the buyer whatever name you want to call her or him, but the truth is she doesn't care and she probably shouldn't, but you can die. Um, so you're groveling or you're pleading or you're, you know, or you're doing whatever you can to just survive. And sometimes you, you know, your supplier doesn't come through. Supplier goes bankrupt, which has happened to us. 
um, sometimes we have devaluations, which has happened in India. I'll give you an example, and you'll understand the, the order of magnitude. When we acquired Tasty Bite, the, in, the Indian rupee to the dollar was 23. 23 rupees equaled one US dollar. And I think it moved to 34 very quickly. And today we're talking 70 plus, seven zero, right? So it gives you an order of magnitude of, of what you're dealing with. Uh, or the average, think about the supply chain. Today, most people, entrepreneurs are facing this crunching of the supply chain. You're talking yeah. about how both in terms of time and in terms of distance it has to come down. Look at our business. Some chickpeas and lentils are imported from Africa. The resin is Japanese. The pouch is Korean. It's coming into India. And now we are in England, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, Singapore, Malaysia. Imagine the average length that a Tasty Bite product would travel. The raw material would travel. And the number of things that can go wrong. So you can look at many dark spots giving you many dark days. And you can say, I'm going to lose my hair. Which, by the way, I used to have a lot more hair. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, you know the joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have proof in 1999, when I quite tasty bite, I had hair. No, but it is, I mean, honestly, this is, uh, we've had, you know, we've had many, many, the, the year we bought out CDC, the private equity player, we became, you know, that money that had to come in to buy that obviously drained the finances of the business. Um, it did give us a year where we didn't know whether we were going to pull through in 2002, and, which was the worst year for us. Um, again, when 9-11 happened, was, we didn't know whether we would pull through. Uh, it was a terrible time for us on many fronts. Um, and of course, in the GFC, we had the same problem. We were affected like anybody else. Um, and there have been many other instances where government regulation suddenly changed. I'll give you one example, the GSP. The GSP is a generalized system of preference. And many entrepreneurs who are in the international business when they buy products into the US and Canada will understand this. The GSP gives duty-free imports from several countries who are part of the WTO GSP signatories. 85 countries in the world. India is one of them. India is one of the biggest beneficiaries of GSP for exports of several products, including food into the United States. The GSP needs to be renewed by US Congress periodically. Every once in a while, somebody comes up and they don't want to renew it, or they've got other things they're fighting about. Um, and sure enough, we know how United Congress is. They've probably forgotten the word United States. There's the divided Congress in the United States, but anyway. Um, and so they forget to renew it. When they forget to renew it, seven-day duties come up. And duties can range from 5% to 15%. Now imagine if your margins are 20% and your duty is 15%, suddenly your business is in trouble. So you can have, you can have several dark days. Uh, but you keep looking. Yeah. What did you do to, to deal with those that uncertainty and the logistics that you describe. I mean, to, as you describe it, 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 it makes my stomach go uneasy just thinking of all the logistics. How, what did you, I mean, again, what was your habit that allowed you to stay in the game in these dark days? Like, did you, was it good eating? Did you, was it scotch? <laughs> like, what was the secret? Yeah, there, there is a business piece and there is a personal philosophical piece, right? To the extent, let me deal with the philosophy first. To the extent that we don't get overjoyed when you see good quarterly results, you also won't get depressed when you see a terrible quarter, which means we don't let the performance of the corporation determine the feelings. You know, many times, some of these emotions that we face are not emotions we choose. I mean, COVID is a great example. When we feel fear, when we feel anxiety, when we feel stress, these are not choices that we can make. Those feelings are real. 
but we can choose how we feel about those feelings. And so at some point in time, if we detach ourselves and say, look, I'm not going to be popping champagne because I have a great quarter, then I should be you know, getting drunk out of sorrow. If I have a bad quarter, then either way I'm an alcoholic, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's a philosophical piece to say, look, how we live our lives has got, you know, it's, it's a decision we make. We can't make everything dependent on the results. So that's the philosophical side. On the business side, and certainly in the consumers, in the CPG space, and this is true for B2B space, we have a lot, large B2B business in Tasty Byte. The margins are super critical. And you need to have margins which allows for failures, which allows for disasters, which allows for unprecedented events, unexpected events. And we've had so many of them that you will constantly find these events eroding your margins. And if you did not have a base that allowed these to happen, I'll give you a simple example, raw onions. Onions in, in India, I mean, India is the second largest producer of fruits and vegetables in the world. And, you know, so there's China, Brazil, India, the US, but in India, the price of onions can go from, you know, meaning five cents, three rupees a kilo to a hundred rupees. The difference can be 30 times in a 12 month period. Mm. Onions is an important raw material, as is tomatoes, as is, let's say, you know, meaning dairy, as is oil. And sometimes these vicissitudes can create havoc to the business if your pricing doesn't allow you to absorb those. Raw material prices are only one part of it. For an exchange, imagine one day it's 50 rupees to the dollar and the next three months later it is 55. It's not small, it's substantive. But you need to have cushion, headroom. And so you need to be able to think that way before it actually happens and not celebrate the profits you're making because you margined up the business and therefore you start spending like you've actually that, like it's real money. It's not real money. You've just made that margin to wait for a crisis. Makes sense. I'd love to go to the acquisition by Mars. What, what, um, your 1500 employee company, you've got these, the five of you have created this incredible juggernaut. What triggered you to sell? So for Mira and I, we, we love children as long as they belong to somebody else. <laughs> uh, it's true. I mean, I'm sure Mira will agree in, in saying that. <laughs> so we, <laughs> so we, we knew at some point in time we had to exit. And the other three were exactly of the same view. This was not a family business for us. None of their children was old enough to be able to take this business forward. And in any case, I believe for an entrepreneur is as important to plan an exit as it is to plan an entry. And the exit is more a journey rather than just one destination. You have to plan it. And we knew that we had other things we wanted to do. We had built a business, like I said, we got lucky. We grew this business every year for 25 years we ran this company. We grew this business every year, 25 years. And we also had other interests in our lives. Um, we wanted to perpetuate, we wanted to pursue those interests. And we also wanted to, you know, um, do what we're doing currently, um, which is, you know, we can talk about that. But we have, you know, we built a corporate, we built a company called Seesaw, Center for the Spread of Affordable Wellness, CSAW where we now think farmers must prosper, consumers must eat healthy, food companies must transform. And in a way, that's the life we led or wanted to live in Tasty Bite. So we're saying it's time to take that up. So it was time to move on. And we had a very smart, by the way, the story is not about the five of us. It's not about Ravi, Hans, and Sohail, or the other three other than Mira and I. We had an outstanding management committee. We have, uh, we have depth in the business and we have expertise across functions. 
whether you pick nutrition, food processing, marketing, sales, logistics, customer service, assurance, engineering, research. TPRC is a jewel in our crown, the Tasty Bite Research Center. So, but, but all five of you presumably had other interests. Uh, again, you grew the business for 25 years. There's presumably nothing stopping you from growing it another 25 years. So I'd be curious, was there a, a as they say, a straw that broke the camel's back? Was there a, a triggering moment no, we, in time? No, no, no. We had planned this exit in 2008. So let me give you a story. We had planned it in 2008 to say we will exit in 2013. So we said we will take five years to exit. And we knew we had to exit because this could not be only our life. If you know the people who ran the business with multiple interests, I was already teaching. Uh, Mira was involved. We had already set up, Mira and I had set up a family foundation way back before we sold in 2013. Like I said, look, it, money was not the driver for us to start Tasty Bite. It was the consequence of our actions. It was not the purpose of our business. Money was never the purpose of the business. And we had a very strong purpose. The, our mission statement was enshrined in every new recruit who came into the company. So this was a mission-driven organization from the get-go. And we knew at some point we just had to build a very powerful, competent, driven team who were committed to the mission. We used to say, you know, we have to build a socially responsible organization that provides consumer delight. This was the mission. It still has the mission. Take me inside the, the room when you announced to your 1,500 employees that right. you'd sold to Mars. Because on the outset, as an outsider listening, um, being a mission-driven company, it sounds very inspiring. And at the same time, selling to one of the world's largest consumer packaged goods companies may have landed on people as being selling out or you know, the, uh, very you know, whatever. Very how nice. did you... How, <laughs> How did, you, how did you make the case to your employees that you weren't doing that, that, that you were in fact? This is a beautiful story. Like I said, the deal happened only in 2017, but I said we planned this in 2008. So there's a story of almost 10 years which is missing in this narrative. We didn't sell to Mars as our first sell. This is a ball. The Tasty Bite is a ball that has bounced many times. The idea was conceived within Pepsi when I was there. I came out of Pepsi, then Tasty Bite in the, the U.S. was born. Unilever is a company that I was involved in at some point. Unilever had something to touch in Tasty Bite. In 2015, we actually got, we, we took this, so let me give a shout out to Barclays. We, we worked with Rothschilds and differently outstanding organizations. We worked with Barclays. Barclays was our banker who took us in 2015 on a deal that we, uh, we were planning to continue to exit. The exit in 2013 did not happen, even though we had a five-year plan to exit. And these things take time, which is why I said it is not a, it's just not an end. It's, it's, it's a journey. That exit actually happened in 2017, and we got a Japanese company called Kagome, an outstanding company. It's probably one of Japan's most respected food businesses. So Kagome bought majority of our parent company. So the five of us kind of almost became partners with the Japanese company. So the employees in the company, by now Tasty Bite was already, uh, you know, it was a serious company. It, mm -hmm. things are happening. it was successful, you know, in its own right. Small than it was, but it was, it was a happening place. It was, it was a lovely company. And my favorite company, by the way, I must say. And we, when we, we gave majority equity to Kagome, and then we spent the next 15 months trying to get them into the business, and they spent time understanding how to run this place. And they are technologically very sophisticated. Play. We learned a hell of a lot from them. And I suspect they learned a bit from us. 
um, and it became clear at the end of about 12 months that this is not a business that we could leave to them or from their perspective, this is not a company that they could run successfully. And so here, a year and a half after we had brought them in, and the company, by the way, already knew that we were working with the Japanese. So we had learned a lot of, you know, a lot of the culture, a lot of the values, a lot of the quality. Their eyes have, their Japanese Kagome managers have different eyes than all of us. They see things that we don't see. So we learned a lot from them. And we only got stronger and better. Uh, but they knew they couldn't run our business. It was very, our business is very sophisticated because of this complex, I used to joke and say, we are the world's smallest multinational way back in 98. Hmm. But by 2015, we were still a multinational. But Japanese, Kagome was largely a Japanese company. We were dealing with multiple countries, multiple employees in different zones and multiple businesses, uh, different languages. It was hard for them to quite understand how to take control. And even though we were training them to do so, and they were hoping to launch Tasty Bite in Japan, which by the way, we had already launched before, we, before they acquired us. Um, so we decided that we would we had a choice, by the way, going back to this call option, put option, drag along, tag along. These are all words that I've used in the, I hate those words, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> bottom line, when you have partners, you want to watch the shareholders agreement, especially if you're in America. Um, you know, it's, anyway, let me not get into that politics of that. Uh, but the bottom line is you have, you have to do this carefully. And luckily, the values of Kagome and the values of the e-com and the Tasty Bite were very similar. They cared about the environment. They cared about the people. And they knew they could not run this company. So what did you do? So we decided to buy back. So it kind of rolled it back. <laughs> so call like, options again? Did, was, what was the structure you did that through? Call options? We had a structure to do that. And Barclays was very useful in that. So... Always when you don't do an outright sale and you do a partial sale with the intention that we will exit and they will come in, you've got to plan you know, Murphy's Law. When things, you know, if things can go wrong, they will. I often say Murphy's Law with India and U.S. works differently. When things can go wrong, they will twice. <laughs> so you had a call option to buy back your shares from well, Kogobi. A little bit more complicated structurally, but... Bottom line, we both knew the right thing to do was for us to run the business, for them not to run the business, or for somebody else to run the business. Uh, and we didn't want to run that for a long time because we had other things we had to do. And you know, How I mean, did you come up with the money to buy back the company? No, it wasn't hard. It was that, by that time, it wasn't hard. And the way we had done it was, it was more structural. It wasn't of just giving money and taking money they were still shareholders in the business and they had agreed of how the structure will work. And then we moved to Goldman Sachs. So the shout out to the next, you asked for iBank that I think the world of, I, I do think very highly of Barclays on the consumer side. I think very highly of Goldman Sachs. They did a great job for us and we had a great relationship with them too. Uh, and, and then we, um, so now Kagome and the e were on the same side. We were the sellers, right? Most of this, by the way, was not being done hush-hush. The culture in Tasty Bite is not hush-hush. It's transparent. Anybody in Tasty Bite in the world could have asked us, hey, by the way, you know, we, if they asked us for our salary, we probably showed them our salary. So <laughs> we wouldn't be saying, I don't want to declare my taxes since I am since I live in Washington, D.C., in this house on Pennsylvania Avenue. I mean, I'm just, it's a joke. But. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so Goldman, you hire Goldman Sachs to, to then sell the company, you and Kagome, to sell the company, and Mars was the ultimate acquirer. Mm -hmm. With, back to my original question. This mission-driven company, it sounds like, it, it not sounds like it, it was it, 
from everything I can hear, a very authentic, right from you and Mira all the way to the executive committee to all your employees, it was very much a mission. How did you, given this transparent sort of culture, justify, if you will, selling as opposed to staying independent? Lovely question. I must tell you, Uncle Ben, I mean, Mars, by the way, has three parts to Mars. And I must tell you, this conversation we've had internally so much. And first of all, let me tell you, Mars is an amazing corporation. I, mean, I had, and all of us, had certain, we all come with, you know, even good people have biases. And I think of myself as a good person with my own share of biases. Uh, but we learned about Mars and we, we always prided ourselves on our values. We cared about the environment. We really did. In taste you buy. I mean, let me just take a little diversion there. I'll give you an example. We, the steam that is generated in the taste you bite factory is not from fuel oil. I mean, it's, it's from sugarcane briquettes. Okay. The oil that we used is not only heated through electric power, it is heated through a reverse transmission of steam. So we have, a, we have an organic farm. And the water that goes into the farm is the water that comes into the plant, gets recycled and comes out. There is not a liter of water that is uh, lost in the Tasty Bite system other than through evaporation. We have no, we have rainwater harvesting, which is done where the water table has come up from 400 feet to 40 feet. We generate tons of vegetable waste every day that goes into a gas generating system which powers our research center and our campus lightings and our corporate cafeteria. So we've lived this life. So we've always been justifiably proud. We didn't talk about this loudly, but this was our life. And everybody in the company lives this life. This is the real truth in Tasty Bite. Yeah. And when we learned about Mars and their commitment to the environment, it made this hubris that I just showed you I feel very humble. What we do is nothing compared to the commitment of the Mars family, quite honestly. And so this came, when we looked at it, Goldman took us to the world. Because Goldman Sachs and we had, a, you know, we were a good company. We were well known. The brand was not unknown in many parts. We happened to meet a large number of corporations. But what we had one advantage. We didn't care about the valuation of the business. That is a very, very important. It takes the weight off our shoulder. But we didn't care. We genuinely didn't care. And I wouldn't go into the specifics, but the deal is none of the five of us cared. Uh, so you just had to land it safely. Because we knew we had 7,500 people who depended on our right decision. 1,500 is only employees, right? I mean, on an average, there are five others who are dependent on those 1,500 in some form or another. And so we had to land this baby safely. Uh, and that was more important. So we met, though, we met a large number of outstanding companies. We were lucky. We met some outstanding people. It was a competitive process. It was not. Uh, it was not a random occurrence. But we, and then we met the team at Mars. We met the CEO of the Mars Food business, and we met the management team of Mars. And it was at one meeting that turned our I meaning. An ecom was there, and this was a meeting in London. And that meeting completely changed our view. And then we said, "Wait, we got to make this happen." What did they say in that meeting that made you change your view? We just showed us our bias. They didn't have to say anything. They just told us we were ignorant without saying it that way. But they spoke about the work that they do and just energy in the room. Sometimes you know, and entrepreneurs know this, when you're, it's almost like when you have your, I always say this, by the way, I don't have children, so I don't have this analogy, the wrong analogy. When, you know, people say, what do you think? This is Tasty Bite is your baby. What do you think about selling it? And I'm saying, wait, I'm not in the business of selling my baby. Tasty Bite is not a baby. I don't sell babies. <laughs> it's true. But when your daughter or your son does want to marry somebody, you do look at 
your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law a little bit differently. You want, you want to say yes because the child wants it, right? Uh, somehow you know that this is going to work. I'd like to think that parents know that their children's marriage is going to work. And I think we knew, you know, that this, this was right for people in Tasty Bite. This was right for Tasty Bite consumers. I guess I'd be, I'd love to go push you a little bit more on that meeting because people listening who might get into a meeting with a potential acquirer, you know, you, you just know when it feels right is a bit nebulous. It's hard for them to understand or, or take that away. What were the signs in that meeting that you were like, yep, this is going to work. This is where I got to land the plane. Yeah, yeah. This is not, yeah, yeah. This is not loosey-goosey. Let me be very specific. Uncle Ben's had, I mean, uh, Mars Foods is a big division. It's not the largest. And among the three, four divisions of Mars Food, it's probably the smallest. They have confectionery, they have pet, pet care, and they had foods. In the food business, they had a few brands we competed with, which we respected. Seeds of Change is an organic grain and rice company, ready to eat. We competed with them. We had them in our crosshairs. In fact, we used to watch them every month and we used to report our market share growth versus theirs. So we had to beat seeds of change, but we respected seeds of change. Uncle Ben's rice was one of the largest prepared foods rice. Uh, and we knew them because they, we didn't like necessarily, you know, their products um, in the way that they were doing it, but it, was, it gave us a good damn volume. And we had retorted rice before Uncle Ben's had. But when they came in, they showed us the way. So we knew they were the 800 pound gorilla, but we were making good progress vis-a-vis -vis them. Our products in our mind was better. And I suspect that the way we were doing it, the retort technology that I spoke about, Uncle Ben's is an expert in that technology. We are probably not bad ourselves. And there was genuine respect. They had scale, we had innovation. And the two of normally go against each other. When you innovate, you often don't get scale. If you're focused on scale, you forget about innovation. So here was a place where genuinely our innovation could meet their scale. But if the values met, if the values didn't meet, then the scale has no meaning. Uh, but if the values meet and they have scale, they have geographical reach, and we make better quality, you know, well, better quality, but certainly great quality product, which they acknowledge as being great quality, then only good outcomes will happen. And Uncle Ben's today is, is still a brand. Tasty Bite today is still a brand. Seeds of Change is still a brand. Dolmio is still a brand. So these brands still survive. And I'm still the chairman of Tasty Bite, uh, by the way. Uh, and it's still a public company, and it is no longer 10 rupees. It is today 10,000 rupees. <laughs> Goldman, how many offers did Goldman Sachs bring to the table? They had uh, the one from Mars I and how many others? That, but I can't tell you that, but let me say that we, we, had a, we had a choice. We had the word. It's a reasonable thing to say. What was the range in value? And again, I'd be curious to know why. The why? why? Percentage? We, percentage? Like, would it have been uh, was Mars? It's a tricky one. I'll pass on that. But let me just say, because that gets very personal. But let me say that um, Mars was not ungenerous by any means. Uh, and yeah, I had leave it at that. We, meaning, this was genuinely, though, John, not about money. This was landing Tasty Bite safely. I, I love that analogy. I can't tell you how important that is. For me right now, that is probably the only important thing. And I think we landed that more than safely. I love that analogy. It's beautiful. And the skeptic in me says, what do you mean it's not about valuation? I mean, there must have been some element of wanting to be paid fairly for this business. But we have for been paid fairly. Value is like beauty, John. It lies in the eyes of the beholder. 
We as entrepreneurs, we are legends in our own mind. <laughs> that is the truth. Who cares? You know, just because I might say I grew this business for 25 years, we brought it from zero to one and then one to 25. And, you know, I can give all these stories, but the truth is, you know, what, why did we start on this journey? Um, so from our perspective, philosophically, we are, you know, where we wanted to be. Uh, that's not a bad place to be. Uh, <laughs> were, were you and the other members of the econ, the, the other five, five of you in, did you all share this philosophy that the valuation didn't matter? Yeah, absolutely. If you are the finance guy. So including the finance guy, who, by the way, is ex Goldman. And <laughs> I mean, this was, and he's doing some amazing work today. Too. Uh, look, this valuation doesn't matter because I mean, the truth, let's face this. When you're an entrepreneur, and most of us who are upper middle class have more money than we would probably spend for the rest of our lives. This is not easy for many people in many cultures to understand. If they haven't understood it after COVID-19, they probably never will. Um, the truth is, this is not about money. This is about who we are. This is about our values. This is about our outcome. I'm not even talking about our legacy. I don't care if people remember Tasty Bite famously. This is our legacy. This is not about us. Right. This, so this is not about Mira's and my legacy or the e-coms legacy. We have a bunch of things we have to do. That to do that involves selling the company you start and moving on to the next. And this is not, you know, I mean, in some sense, this is managing a purpose. So you keep moving. You're not a hero because you sold high or a terrible failure because you think you sold low. You're just moving on to the next big thing. Hopefully it's bigger than what you did or more important. Speaking of big, what did Mars pay for Tasty Bite? <laughs> I wish, you know, I wish I could say that. But enough to, you know, the public company numbers are all, you know, available. Uh, but let me, let me give you a sense of, just relative scale. At the time when we acquired it from Unilever, the share price approximately was 10 rupees a share for Tasty Bite in 1998, give or take. 1999, we turned the business around, and today the share price of Tasty Bite is about 11,000. I haven't seen today. So in the Bombay Stock Exchange, there are very few. I'm reasonably sure a handful of companies who have moved from 10 to 10,000. 1,000 times in you know, 17, 18 years. It's amazing. Uh, so it's, like I said, just, you know. I'm not letting you off the hook until you answer my question because I've asked it twice now and you still dodged it both times. How did you? tell your employees that you'd sold because again a lot of our listeners we get they they get really nervous about that conversation about no, I tell my employees listen okay okay no 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 i'm not i'm not dodging the question in fact i'd love i'm glad you pinned me down <laughs> one of the very important that this is where mars becomes super important one of the th everybody talks about reps and warranties and entrepreneurs listening to this will know reps and warranties are conditions that companies put when they buy entrepreneurial companies entrepreneurs do have a choice to say hey do you have your own reps and warranties or at least commitments that you expect do you want your employees not to be fired do you want certain policies of your business that you're really proud of to be retained or perpetuated do you really care about things in your own business that must absolutely last way beyond you're gone? In which case, pick the buyer who respects that value. If that value is important to you and not important to the buyer, ignore that. So by the time we went into the, uh, you know, to our employees, I already knew those employees were safe, if anything, the employees got a sudden chance of becoming global. The employees are tasty by the I mean, out. And Mars offers global opportunities for leadership. So this is not about that insecurity. This is actually about a larger potential 
So you're able to now offer a world much larger than you could have offered as an entrepreneur, as a CEO of a small company. Now, however big you are, I'm not as big as Mars, not even close. And so this is an opportunity. In fact, it's almost incumbent upon you. You're responsible for providing that opportunity. So it's not as hard a conversation as we think. Unless you think you're going to turn your back and all these guys are going to get fired, no, no, no. That's how did big companies like Mars they paper legally paper their reps and warranties in bulletproof share purchase agreements, right? You're 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 signing those, and they are well documented. How did you do the reverse? In other words, get Mars to guarantee that they wouldn't fire all your employees. Did, was it a handshake deal or did you actually paper that? Look, I won't get into the details, but I'll tell you two things. One, can this become a piece of paper? I believe it can. Did we do that? I'm not going to answer that question. However, this is the question that when you understand the diligence works two ways. All we think about is the acquirer doing the diligence. We never spend money as a company being acquired, doing diligence on the acquirer. Because it's just structurally made the other way around. If you really cared about your business and not about your valuation, we would do that diligence. You would push for those pieces if you suspect it. Or if your diligence is strong, you would raise the issues or you would look around. So if you, if you really work, we were, we were lucky in a way that we, we, we chose Mars like Mars, I suspect, had many options. Companies like us, Mars can buy many of them. But I think Mars bought us for a reason. And I think we chose Mars for a reason. So you can call it an arranged marriage or you can call it a date. I don't care which one it is. But the truth is, I say this, by the way, to, to Mira all the time. Marriages may be made in heaven, but the maintenance is here on earth. I like that. You know? So every day when you're, you, and I'm still, like I mentioned, I'm still the chairman of Tasty Bite. And I don't believe that I have any values that fundamentally Mars has a problem with. Genuinely, you know, that is not true. And in fact, if anything, I would say, you know, the reverse is just as true. Um, they care about, you know, stuff that we care about deeply. I can learn a few things, not a few, a lot, about the way they deal with it. So I, we were lucky. Before we go, tell us a little bit about Seesaw, where people can find more information about that. So Seesaw, C-S-A-W, Seesaw.co. Seesaw is an acronym um, called uh, Center for the Spread of Affordable Wellness. That's the brand. So think of it as our next gig. And Seesaw has three, it's a three-part vision. I think of John Lennon and his song, Imagine. Yeah. Uh, so imagine a world where farmers prosper, consumers eat healthy, and food companies transform. That's the vision of Seesaw. So we relocated from Stanford, moved to Singapore, and we've set up Seesaw in Singapore. I mean, we're Americans now living in Singapore, and there are many of many Americans here, so it doesn't feel so we are, you know, we're Asian Americans. I think of myself as a double hyphenated Indian American Singapore living in Singapore. <laughs> right? So anyway. Uh, so CISO has three parts. It has, a, it has a research center we call the AFRC, an Applied Food Research Center, which is kind of like the Tasty Bite Research Center, which we set up, which is an accredited research center that is a center for excellence in prepared foods, R&D. We do a lot of work in product innovation, process innovation, but in new technologies, new processes, new ingredients, so that the products must make you well. That's AFRC, where we almost say that corporations and companies must no longer in the food business say, 
What's my share of mind, share of wallet, share of stomach, share of plate, or even share of daily calories? That we consider an entitlement. You don't have that entitlement as a food company. We say we have an accountability as a food company. What is our share of wellness? And so AFRC focuses on that, on designing products. So it's almost like a design studio. And we work with labs around, you know, in, in Singapore, which is an outstanding research and technology place. So that's one piece. And we work with labs around the world. The second is the Seesaw Accubator, uh, which is a, think of it as a incubator plus accelerator. Hmm. Accubator, love it. It's called an accubator. It's a trademark. It's called a seesaw accubator. We invest in food entrepreneurs who are dedicated to wellness. And then we have an advisory where we'd like to think of working with governments, working with large corporates, and working with the very companies we invest in in an entrepreneurial world. Governments and policy, because there's so much changing in, in agriculture and in science, that governments are playing catch up. Uh, you know, is GMO labeling important, not important? How do you do GMO labeling? Is cell-based meat meat or not meat? Is plant-based dairy daily or is it milk? Um, I mean, the number of definitional issues, plant-based protein, plant-based meats, just a large number of issues. COVID, trade barriers, non-trade barriers, tariff barriers, uh, scientific barriers. Many issues have to be dealt with the governments. That's a piece. Uh, and how do you link food with affordable wellness? And then we have corporates. How do you rethink your mission, not your strategy of becoming responsible for consumers' wellness and not be just, you know, I mean, you can't be the food industry, can't be the one that's providing customers to the healthcare industry. The food industry has to protect the consumers and they hold the wellness of the consumers in the palm of their hands. And that's a fundamental realization that has to come into the food industry. And so our advisory works on that. And of course, entrepreneurs on that piece. It all, yeah. I was going to say, it doesn't surprise me that CESA is a mission-driven organization. You know, you don't have to be an NGO to be a mission-driven organization. But having said that, I want to take a minute and tell you, way before we sold to Mars, and a little after we got Kagome in, we actually have a family foundation in the U.S. It's called the mavfoundation.org. M-A-V. Very uncreative. It's Mira and Ashoka Given Foundation. For a couple of marketers, I'd expect more from you. I know, exactly. <laughs> Once you hear about the foundation, you will know this has got nothing to do with us. mavfoundation.org, M-A-V-F, um, it's basically, it's a fully funded family foundation. We don't raise money. Uh, it's a fully funded family foundation dedicated to ending hunger and malnourishment in America in a manner that is self-reliant, sustainable, and healthy. And it's mavfoundation.org. And hunger in America is not a tiny problem. It's a humongous problem. We are talking about 50 million Americans nearly on SNAP. SNAP is a more polite word today for food stamps. Food stamps we don't yeah. have food stamps in America anymore. It's sophisticated. It's called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The name got changed in a couple of, no, 15 years ago. Um, and so that's that foundation. I don't think of Tasty Bite as being different from the foundation as being different from Seesaw. We don't have to be mission-driven only because we are an NGO. No, we don't have to be, you know, uh, process-driven only because we are a corporation. And we don't have to only have imagination because we are an entrepreneur. You know, we are saying, look, this triangle of having a, you know, meaning some mission on the one hand, some rigor and process on the other hand, and imagination and risk-taking on the third hand, don't have to belong to the NGO, the corporate world, and the entrepreneurs. They live together. So for us, Tasty Bite, the MAV Foundation, and Seesaw, you know, they just live together. Well, Ashok, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to learn about your story and hear your philosophy. Frankly, it's, it's been really refreshing 
for me, so much of our show is about valuation and, you know, juicing the negotiation and leverage and so forth. And today was just a, a really refreshing departure from that. And so I'm grateful for you taking me there and, and sharing that Thank with us. You, John, but I love this conversation. I love your energy, by the way, and I love your persistence. You have a chilling <laughs> your purpose that keeps me on message. So I love it. Honestly, this is, I love this conversation. So well, it's, it, so it's mutual. Uh, continued success. We'll put all the, the links in, in the show notes and I, uh, I wish you wonderful luck with, uh, with Seesaw. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ashir. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com slash built to sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.